Thank you, Dave, for leading so well this morning. Thank you to the musicians for leading us in those songs of worship. I wonder if when Dave was reading that passage, you, like me, a few weeks ago, were saying to yourself, what on earth is this about? And you were scratching the back of your head, and maybe you were reading it for the first time, and it just seemed to be so much in there, backwards and forwards. Well, don't worry, because those in this room that have read it for a hundred times are still scratching their heads over this passage. I've heard it, I've read that commentators believe it's one of the most difficult to understand passages in all of Scripture. A few weeks ago, I was joking with uh, Keith last week, because Keith had also a difficult passage of Scripture to look at last week, and he handled it so well a few weeks ago. I was invited to a meeting to discuss and plan out the, the preaching of this book of Hebrews, and I didn't make that meeting. I'm going to make the next one. <laughs> but thank you anyway for giving me this passage. It has meant much study and much reconsideration of uh, what I believe and what I have come to know. I don't think we ever stop moving forward in Christian experience and in Christian understanding. But this morning I'm mindful that, as we've had mentioned, the young people are present. We've got the Ignition and Sunseekers group here, who are not normally here. They've not been party to our study in Hebrew so far. And so this morning I have planned to keep it brief, make it simple, and not get involved in any contentious issues. So if you're looking forward to a debate, you're not going to get one this morning. I'm sorry about that. If you're looking for me afterwards and saying, you never mentioned this, I'm telling you now, I won't be looking to speak to you about that. Come and tell me how God saved you. That's great. Come and tell me how, how God has blessed you through reading this passage. Uh, but we're not going to talk about any of the contentious issues in this passage this morning. One thing that we've all discovered this morning, haven't we, from Chloe. I feel for Adam Tuffrey. What is it like to have a little sister that can beat you up? I don't know. But we do have the young people here, so we're going to be mindful of them this morning as we look at this passage. If all that sounds like an excuse for a bad sermon, well, you'll have to be the judge. But we need God's help to look at this. So let's just offer this time that we have together before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage that has been read in public in your house. We just ask now that we would handle it well with all wisdom, with all understanding, and that Heavenly Father, you would speak to us from the very pages of this Bible text that we have read this morning. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 4 and verse 1, look at the first word that we read. We read the word, therefore. Now that tells us that that's there for a reason. It's there to link it with the passage that Keith spoke on last week in chapter 3 from verse 7 to 19. And so we're going to be referring back to that passage this morning as we try and unravel what's there. But it says in that opening line, therefore, since the promise still stands, since the promise of entering God's rest still stands. What is his rest? We'll get to that a little later. But we're reminded by the, the writer to the Hebrews that this has been mentioned before in the previous chapter. And so we need to look at the closing verses in the previous chapter to find out what, it, what he's talking about. And again in verse 7 of chapter 4 and verse 11 of chapter 4, he's going to also refer back and link back and say therefore. So we need to look back at the therefore. It goes on to say this, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. The NIV doesn't translate this very well. It doesn't actually mean let us be careful. It should really say let us be fearful. Let us be fearful. That we don't fall short of the promise of entering God's rest. So we're reminded back to last week and Keith told us about the people of Israel and for the sake of the young people we've been studying this book. We don't know who it was written to. 
but we believe by what's in it, the pages, that it's to a group of Jewish converts, Hebrews, who had uh, been fascinated by the Lord Jesus and come and joined a church, but they were in danger of going back to their old way of life. They'd become disenchanted with what they had discovered. Perhaps they thought to themselves, well, this is a struggle. I had, I, I had more in the, in the law and in the offerings of the, of the Old Testament. And so they're in danger of going back. They're in danger of leaving it there. And as Keith reminded us last week, and I wholeheartedly agree with what he said, we need to be careful that we need to keep believing. Because if we turn our backs on it, it's not that... As the Lord Jesus says, no one can pluck them out of their hands. It's not that we're plucked out of his hands. It's that we weren't there in the first place. If we walk away from Christianity and turn our backs on it, we, we just show the characteristic of somebody that perhaps wasn't saved in the first place. The writer of the Hebrews is aware of their situation and he says to them, look, be careful. Be fearful even that you don't lose out just as generations, centuries ago did. You need to be fearful. They stood on the verge of the promised land. They had the promises of God to enter into it and find his rest. And what did they do? They turned their backs on it and they said no to God. The writer of the Hebrews, who again, we don't know who that was. If you read ten commentaries, you'll hear ten different suggestions for who wrote the book of Hebrews, but he understands the situation that the readers of his, his letter are in, and he says, you need to be fearful. Why do we need to be fearful? Well, look at verse 19 of chapter 3. We need to be fearful because of unbelief. We need to be fearful of unbelief in our lives. And the writer of the Hebrews is aware of their situation, aware of their predicament, aware of their plans to perhaps go back on what they had found. And he says, you need to be aware, you need to be fearful of unbelief in your life. You see, they didn't believe or trust in God. They didn't believe in his promise of rest in the promised land. They didn't believe in the salvation that he offered. They didn't believe in that promise that he had offered to them and as a result they stood on the banks of the river Jordan and they didn't cross and they spent the rest of their lives wandering around the desert until an entire generation had been lost and only two from the generation that were saved from Egypt entered into the promised land Caleb and Joshua and Keith reminded us about them last week the writer to the Hebrews is reminding these people that would know the Old Testament well. And he's saying, think about that generation. They were so close, and yet they were so far because of their unbelief. You say, wait a minute, that, that sounds harsh to me. You mean to say that a bit of doubt or a bit of uncertainty, a bit of that, they, they lost it all because of that. No, we're not talking about doubt, friends. We all have doubts. We all have things we're uncertain of. We all have situations where it's difficult to trust God in because we want to keep it for ourselves. And even though we've prayed to God about many things sometimes, we still, still want to try and fix it ourselves. We're not talking about doubts. We're talking about unbelief. Why should we be fearful of unbelief? Look at verse 18 of chapter 3. We're to be fearful of unbelief because, and to whom did God swear that they would not enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed. Friends, we need to be fearful of unbelief because unbelief leads to disobedience. Unbelief leads to disobedience or defiance. You say to me, wait a minute. You mean that living the Christian life we need to constantly be afraid, need to be fearful all of the time. Well, that doesn't sound like any kind of life that I want to live. I don't want to constantly be fearful of unbelief, lest I lose the promise. No, friends, listen to what the writer is saying. 
You need to be fearful of unbelief because disobedience leads to rebellion against God. And the people that stood on the shores of the promised land and did not enter turned their backs on God. They would not trust in his promises. So this morning, young friend and older friend, you need to examine your hearts as I do mine. And we need to come to a point where we need to say, have we ever trusted God? Do we believe him for salvation? And if you still think that's a bit harsh, because wait a minute, you say that the Christian life is being fearful all the time. You know, when I speak, I like to use personal illustrations for my life. I've got to admit that in studying this passage, I, I struggled for, to find personal illustrations, and so I stole one. But I'm going to make it applicable to, to my life. Is it really wrong to be fearful? Is it really long to have a bit of fear about unbelief and the dangers that that might bring? Well, imagine when you were young. Some of us, that's easy to do. It's not so long ago. Some of us, it's a bit longer. But imagine when you were young and you had that garden. We lived in a house once that was triangular shaped, the garden, and there was no back garden. So all of our garden was the front of the house. And so our children, very young, used to play in the front garden of the house. And they used to play on their little bikes and scooters and on the drive. And we would say to them this, enjoy the garden, play in the garden, but do not go out of those gates. Why? Because the road is dangerous. You need to fear what can happen in the road. We live opposite a park now. And so the children often go over to the park to play. But we tell them when they leave the house and go over on their bikes to play, we say, now... Watch out for the road. We need to have a healthy fear of what might happen, the consequences of not listening to that. Now you tell me, when your parents, when you were young, said, mind the road, it's dangerous, did that spoil your enjoyment of your garden? Did that spoil your enjoyment of the park that you played in or the woods that you built a shelter in? don't know if kids do that these days. Mine seem to spend all the time uh, talking to friends on their phone or on the computer. But I used to build shelters and climb trees and swing on ropes. Now, did my fear of the road spoil that fun? No. Not a bit of it. In fact, it enhanced it because it meant that if I was fearful of the road, I got to go and play. Friends, it's the same for us. The writer to the Hebrews is talking about this distant past generation who missed out because of unbelief disobeyed God. And he says, look, be fearful lest you end up like them. In fact, if you read on, it says this, be fearful unless you be found to have fallen short of it. You see, they, like us, had a promise. They had a promise of rest. And yet, they never, ever got to see it. Why? Because of their unbelief. Because as Keith reminded us last week in Numbers 13, verse 30, when Caleb and Joshua come back and Caleb says, yes, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's a wonderful promise that God's got for us. We can do it. Their reply, every one of them said, no, we can't. The people in there are stronger than us and bigger than us. And so we're not going to even try. And as a result, they did not enter the rest that God has promised. Goes on to say in verse 2 this, We also have had the gospel preached to us, just as they did. You say, wait a minute again. You're telling me that a people in the Old Testament, centuries ago, Heard the gospel? Surely that can't be right. Surely there's no gospel in the Old Testament. Surely you mean the New Testament. No, it says they also had the gospel preached to them just like us. Only the gospel in the Old Testament, it's a wonderful thing. It's there in the pictures. They had the sacrifices. They had the offerings, the peace offerings. They knew all about the Passover lamb that they still celebrate today. In the Jewish tradition, they had the gospel preached to them even in the law. Don't believe me? Book of Exodus chapter 34. This is the law being written down for the second time on the stone tablets. The God has told Moses to get some new tablets. 
And he's writing the law and he's recording it. And this is what God says in the middle of it all. He says this, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Friends, they did have the gospel preached to them. In the symbols and the signs and the types. But they didn't see it. They rejected it. They rejected a God who is slow to anger. They rejected a God who is compassionate and forgives sins. And they said no to God. What was their problem? What was the problem that they had? They'd seen everything. God had provided for them in the desert. God had given them manna. God gave them quail. God gave them water. They, they had the promise. You know, they'd seen God do it before. What was their problem? It says at the end of verse 2 what their problem was. It was of no value to them. Why? Because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. That was their problem, friends, this morning. They did not combine what they had seen, what they had heard, what they had experienced with faith. And as a result, they rejected God's provision of salvation and rest. What about us this morning? That was centuries ago. What about us this morning? What, 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 are we really in the same predicament? Are we really in the same danger as them? Jump to verse 11 of chapter 4. And the writer of this passage does this. We're going to go back in a moment to find out what rest is. But he, he jumps now. If you like, this just leaps on from verse 2. Verse 11 says this, Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Again, the NIV is not a very good translation, so I've put there on the screen, Let us be diligent. Let us be diligent to enter God's rest, lest we, like them, fall short. It takes commitment. It takes belief. It takes combining what we've heard with faith. And this is what the writer to the Hebrews is trying to bring to their attention in that day. And I believe he would bring to our attention today. You tell me, wait a minute, you're telling me I've got to be diligent. I've got to not be like them with unbelief and so therefore become disobedient. I get that, but you're telling me I've got to work at it. I've got to struggle with it. That doesn't sound like a free gift of salvation to me. I've heard that the gospel is free. I've heard that being saved is a free gift of God. What do you mean you've got to be diligent? I mean, friends, as verse 2 says, you've got to combine it with faith. You've got to put faith into action. The book of James that we're studying in the evening is all about that. In fact, the writer uh, James says in the book, uh, the writer that says in James, I think it's chapter 2, he says that faith without action is dead. We've got to combine it with faith. How can I illustrate this as well? Because that still sounds confusing, doesn't it? That still sounds like this isn't a free gospel. Well, it is, friends, but we need to combine it with faith. A man that's in the news a lot at the moment, Sam Woodhead. He's on his gap year, he's in Australia, he's on a remote farm, he gets a bit bored, his family have told us since, and so he goes for a run, and he gets lost. And a massive manhunt is underway to try and find him. We're told that he takes, he's taken off pieces of clothing, he's kept himself uh, hydrated by drinking the fluid of his contact lens water, and uh, eventually he's found a helicopter comes to the rescue and it's great to know that Sam Woodhead 18 is going to carry on and enjoy his gap year. When that helicopter hovered above, when it spotted him, when it came down to rescue him, Sam had a decision to make. Sam needed to want to be saved. Sam needed to trust that the person that was coming was a rescuer, 
Sam needed to put his faith in the person rescuing. As a result, Sam is going to come back to England and next year he's going to Sandhurst and he's going to become a trained to be an officer in the army. He's going to work. He's going to give something back. Well, friends, that's a simple picture, maybe not quite good enough, but it's a picture to us of what the writer is saying here. Look, God has told you his promises. Each of us has heard the gospel. Each of us has been told, either in ignition or sun seekers or in Sunday school or at holiday club or in the church, what God has done to provide salvation. The fact that we're an unbelieving people, the fact that we fall short of his standards, the fact that he gave his son because he is a loving God and a compassionate God and he sent the Lord Jesus Christ to us. That anyone who believes in him, anyone who accepts his offer will not perish as those people did but have everlasting life. But friends, we need to take that step of faith. We need to combine it with faith. So my question to you this morning is, have you? Have you been diligent in what you have accepted in your life? Or is it still a story? Is it still a nice story and a a compassionate story and one that makes us feel warm and one that makes us feel safe even but is it still a story or have you combined it with faith have you put your trust in the rescuer if you have I believe we are told we will enter that rest but what is that rest what is that rest that he speaks at? We need to look at the verses in between just to quickly find out what that rest is. Verses 3 and 4 says this, Now we who have disbelieved enter that rest just as God has said. And then later on in that verse he says, His work has been finished since the creation of the world, for somewhere he's spoken about the seventh day in these words, and on the seventh day God rested from all his work. He's describing their God's rest. God created for six days, and each day, look at it in Genesis 2 if you want to, and at the end of each day, there was morning and there was evening the first day. Second day, there was morning, there was evening, second day, and so on to the sixth day. And in Genesis 2, 2, it says this, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Notice it doesn't say there was morning there was evening. God is still at rest from his work of creation. And the writer to the Hebrews is saying that God now wants us to enter that rest. God now wants to enjoy God's rest and it's his rest. Then goes on to say this in verses 5 and 6. Again, in the passage above, he says, They shall never enter my rest, but it still remains that some will enter that rest, although those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go. The writer reminds us that there was a group of people that we won't labour anymore, because we've spoken about it this morning, who didn't enter that rest. Why? Because of unbelief. Unbelief that led to disobedience. Unbelief that led them to say no to God. But then he tells us, in verse 8, that Joshua did lead some into the land. There was a generation that was raised up after that generation, and Joshua and Caleb led them into the land, but he tells us in verse 7, that if Joshua had succeeded in bringing that rest about, then he wouldn't have said years later through David that there is a still a rest that remains. This is how it can get confusing, isn't it? Speaks of God's rest, and it's something that God wants us to have. Speaks of the people that didn't enter the rest. Speaks of David centuries ago, speaking of today, we can enter that rest. We need to look at verse 9 to perhaps appreciate what it really means. Verse 9 goes on to say this, There remains then a Sabbath rest, word that isn't found anywhere else in the Bible, for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Friends, the message that the, Hebrew, the writer to the Hebrews wants to get over to these people that he's concerned about 
And the message to get over to us today is that there still remains then a rest that we can enter into. A rest that is available to all. And it's a rest that's available, and you'll notice later on in verse 9 says, for the people of God. Are you of the people of God? Is it a rest that you have entered into? I believe I have. I believe on a day 34 years ago, whatever it is, I can't add up, 30 odd years ago that I trusted Christ. Thank you, yeah. We can all say that we've trusted Christ long ago. But friends, as Keith brought to us this, is it still relevant today? Is it still making an impact on our life today? Are we still showing that we're a follower of him today? Was it something that was genuine then, or was it just a story in the past? Friends, the writer to the Hebrews says in verse 9, there still then remains a Sabbath rest that the people of God can have today. Today. If you hear God's voice, do not harden your hearts. Friends, we can enter into that rest and again we could talk for hours about what it might be. But I believe it to simply be this. Picture somebody struggling in the, in the sea. They're being tossed around by the waves and they're on a raft and you, you're struggling to try and get somewhere and you're trying to stay afloat but you know that you, you can't really do anything. This is a massive ocean. This is a big problem. I am never going to get to where I need to get to. That's how each of us lives their lives without Christ. We're trying to keep things afloat. We're trying to find peace. We're trying to find assurance. We're trying to find hope. And we look to all things, enlightenment. We look to different mysticisms to try and find it. We look to money. We look to relationships. We, we look to each other to try and find that rest. But we know in our heart of hearts that we will never fully enter into that rest. Not until the Lord Jesus came, died on a cross, so that we can stop the work of trying to save ourselves. The rest I believe we enter to, enter into when we become a Christian is the rest that God has provided for us in his salvation. We don't work to save ourselves. We accept what God has done through Christ and therefore we stop, we rest from that work of trying to make it work ourselves. The Bible tells us that we've all fallen short of God's glory. There's nothing you or I could do to save ourselves. But if we accept what the Lord Jesus Christ has done upon the cross, then we enter that rest. But I believe that it's not just a rest for today. I believe there's a clear indication in Scripture that it's a rest forever too. Someone has put it like this, when we become a Christian, it's the inauguration of that rest. We, we stop struggling, we stop trying to save ourselves and we enter the rest on the day of our salvation, but it's a day to come, it will not be the inauguration, it will be the consummation of that rest. Because we will enter into his presence forever. No more fighting, no more struggling, no more disease, no more death, no more tears, no more pain. We will enter fully then the consummation of our rest, I believe, to be heaven. Now, as I've said before today, if you read the commentators, they all disagree on what it is and when it is and how it is. But that's my take on it that I offer to you this morning. One question remains then for us to answer. How can I enter? How can I experience that rest? I, I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired of trying to get it right. I'm tired of failing all the time. How can I enter that rest? Verse 3 has the answer for us. Now we who have believed enter that rest. I need to believe the gospel. I need to put faith in action. I need to trust. I need to abide in Christ and what he has done for me. And I know in James, and uh, we'll possibly hear more about that later, it doesn't mean that we do nothing from now on. 
Just as that Sam who was saved will go and serve his country in a year's time when he goes to Sandhurst. We who are saved, it's like the picture we've got in heaven when we're giving crowns and award. What do we do with them? We lay them at his feet. We give them. And so when we're saved, we give our lives to him and we offer our lives for his service. doesn't mean that from now on we can just take it easy. We can't do anything about our salvation, but we work for Christ in that rest until the day that we meet him in heaven. Jesus said to me, to, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, uh, these words. And this is something of the promised rest that we have. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus says today, friends, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, struggling to try and solve it ourselves, to save ourselves. Come to me, and I will give you rest. We had to read in our passage verses 12 and 13 and I just want to leave them really without comment for you. They're perhaps separate from the passage we've read but we'll just look at what they say. First of all verse 12 says this in Hebrews chapter 4. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Friends, this morning, if you're feeling uncomfortable, if you're feeling challenged, that's the word of God penetrating into your life, cutting into the very soul of your existence, speaking to you, goes on to say this in verse 13. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. You ask me a question this morning, am I saved? Friends, I don't know if you are. I can look at your life, as Keith explained last week, and I can see the signs of whether it looks like you're living the life of a believer. But I don't truly know why, because I haven't got God's eyes. It's hidden from my sight. Only you and God know whether you have trusted him and put faith in action. My prayer is this morning that no one will leave this place still being un, in unbelief, in disobedience to God. My prayer is that all will have entered that rest, would have said yes to the work of Christ. Because as we read in verse 3, we who have believed enter that rest. Have you? I pray that you have. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please, if this difficult passage, we would just ask that you would take away anything that wasn't from you this morning. If there is anything left for us to take away, Father, help us to understand the message of this text. Father, also help us to understand this, that if we have truly believed in all confidence and knowledge that we are safe in the arms of Jesus, and the knowledge that we are resting in his salvation, free from fear of death and certain of a promised rest. But Father, I do pray this morning that if there is anyone who has not ever offered their life to you, trusted in your word and in your promises and in what the Lord Jesus has done for them, then I ask that they will be prevented from leaving this place undone. The Heavenly Father, you will unsettle their hearts. You will allow your word to penetrate deep into their very existence. That you will continue to talk to them, to speak to them, to challenge them. 
over what they have done with your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would take all fear and doubt away from them. And as we're about to sing, Heavenly Father, these words, I make it a prayer for us all. Visit us with thy salvation. Enter every trembling heart. Let us all in thee inherit. Let us find thy promised rest. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we offer you thanks for this time we've had together this morning. Amen.